Okay, let's me explain what's going on. Uh, I decided to make a series of videos about CCD. I heard from some beekeepers in the area, there was some big losses going on. They start to talk about the word colony collapse disorder again. I also saw in the news some articles regarding CCD, so I don't know if the topic is up again, it's hot. Uh, so I decided to do this. I'm gonna ask private industry, university researchers, um, government institution, and beekeepers a very simple question. What is the good, the bad, and the ugly about colon collapse disorder? Colon collapse disorder was a very intriguing phenomenon. Nobody really knew what's going on, but the, the consensus right now is the multifactorial thing that affect the bees and make, and make them sick and they die. So viruses, bacteria, uh, fungi, pesticide, poor nutrition, etc. But my point is after 12 years of research, uh, what we learned, uh, what's the new, what's going on regarding CCD? Everybody's satisfied with the answers we got so far? I don't think so. There is a lot of frustration around there and I wanna ask these very influential people about their opinion about CCD. So before further ado, my first guest was Jay Evans, Dr. Jay Evans from USDA Research B Research Lab. He's the research leader there and he's working with CCD from 12 years now since I got in the lab in 2008. I could I could see the people that are working for from the very beginning when everything started. So Jay might have very interesting uh, things to say about CCD and he invited me to his house and a beautiful farm with lots of animals, a very, very interesting and very nice uh, afternoon we spent together talking about CCD. I hope you guys enjoy. Please subscribe to follow up the, all those these new interviews that I'm going to be making. And before further ado, let's talk about bees. Hey, Jay! It's good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome. Yeah. You, you. you live in a fantastic place, Jay. Look at that. Do you mind if I show everybody? This is a circus. We've got sheep and teenagers, uh, which is a bad combination. Uh oh. Yeah. Oh, look at them. Oh, look at them. Hello. Hello, who are you? Oh, are you scared? Hello, who are you? And today I'm here with Jay Evans, USDA Bee Research Lab leader, and we're talking about CCD today. How are you, Jay? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Umberto, and thanks for the chance to talk with you. I'm really excited about your channel. I think this is a great way for scientists and beekeepers to connect and share their own insights and their own backgrounds, and I really appreciate what you're doing there. And uh, as always, I uh, look forward to speaking with you. What I'm trying to do here is to create a community and, uh, where everybody can answer, can ask questions and I'm going to try, together with specialists like Jay, to, to answer all of those. So that's what we're trying to do here. And today we're talking about something that's a little... <laughs> Un unsettled, as they say. Yes, unsettled. Yeah, that's a good word to put that. Colony Collapse Disorder. Jay, I have a couple questions. It's been 12 years. Um, 
I start to work with you at the with the new people at the USDAB Research Lab in 2007, something like that. It's been a while. I spend a lot of my time in CCD samples, trying to figure out that what that is. It's been 12 years now, and I still with that feeling that something is not solved. Where are we with CCD, and where are we going? Are we okay with whatever we're there? Can we do better? What's going on? Well, that's that's many good questions there, and I think I think in my sense, I also have to step back way before you and I um, in the history of beekeeping and bee research. And colony collapse disorder or phenomena like this had been observed over time, over centuries even. Um, by beekeepers, uh, events that were unexplainable by the measurements of the day, perhaps the tools available. And that's, that's the challenge that this presented. I think there were a few beekeepers in the, in the world and active, and a few scientists who had seen phenomena like CCD in the 1980s. And this sort of rang a bell with them. So when, when it first came up in 2006, 2007, as as you mentioned, when you started researching it with us, uh, for all of us, it was a new phenomenon. We hadn't seen, hadn't really thought about something like this, but for a few in the room, they'd seen similar events in the past and, and they could offer their insights and maybe their frustrations in those past events. Um, so it is, as you know, it's a, it's a syndrome or a phenomenon that's defined by what's not there almost as much as what is there. Colony collapse disorder is, is defined by a, a rapid loss of worker bees within the colony, apparently not related to the health of the queen because there's brood, there's food available to raise those brood. Uh, but something happened in the recent history of these colonies whereby the workers decreased, dropped away from the colony and in the views of many people and, and the, from the outside, if you're not monitoring it, by the hour, it looks as if a bunch of bees just flew off and forgot how to come home. And that's, that's almost all many of us had to go with when we first uh, were introduced to this phenomenon. It would be very complicated to study something that you can see. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's, all, it's, a, it's a negative uh, symptom, as it were, so we had to work with that. So where we are now? Can you tell me the good, the bad, and the ugly. Ooh, okay. <laughs> well, that's cool. I, 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 I will try. Um, <laughs> well, I think the good, and this you were a big part of this with your virus work, is that when this happened, there was a great enthusiasm amongst many researchers to try to tackle this. I think everybody had ideas, energy, um, collaborations. We brought in many people who are new to the honeybee field who came in with their talents, perhaps they were seeking fame, perhaps they were seeking vast wealth, or but in many cases they were seeking altruistically to try to help address this phenomenon. So our, the ranks of researchers uh, studying honeybee health, I'd say almost doubled within the first year because of this new interest uh, in solving this phenomenon. So that was the good part. We had new talents and new energies for honeybee research. Um, moving on to the bad, I'd okay. say the, uh, <laughs> the bad really arose over time when, when for all of this effort um, we didn't see any quick answers. We didn't find phenomena that were repeatable in each instance of colony collapse disorder. Um, and again, by the absence in some cases of the actual subjects who had died, we didn't have materials to really resolve this. Um, and it's not to say we had no, nothing to work with. We had dead bodies in many cases. Uh, we had hive materials that could be analyzed for pesticides, for nutritional status. And so we did have you know, some elements that we could start to tackle this phenomenon. But the, as time went by, as you know, um, none of those really were the complete answer to what the beekeepers had observed in the field. It is, it is a very complicated field to study. I jumped from human virology to honeybee virology because my father was a beekeeper. I had the virology background. So it was a good combination to come in and start 
to join the team and the help and I could see in my in my bench how difficult it is to work with bees and how challenging it is to isolate the variables that we need to isolate to get concrete and repeatable answers. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Why is why it so hard to have a concrete, repeatable results in a honeybee field? Well, <laughs> a very complex question, I think, in many ways. Part of it, I think we really were facing a multifaceted syndrome. There were things going on that weren't simply, um, you know, represented by a single flu virus or virus coming through, although many of us still hold tight to the virus, uh, viruses being an important factor in this. Uh, so I think the biology was complex. But then as you touched on, we also come into this with our own uh, backgrounds, maybe biases. I'm largely a, an indoor biologist these days. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I see different things than, than I would see were I out with the bees day in and day out. And so it took us a while, I think, as communities to kind of come together and see, to talk to each other, to be able to, to um, explain what really clearly what had been seen based on laboratory results and for the beekeeper standpoint and the field researchers, what they were seeing in the field that was really um, solid and, and um, diagnostic for this syndrome. So I think all of us um, took us a little while to get, maybe to get used to each other as it were, and to try to uh, understand each other's strengths in this and also our own weaknesses. Why, why you know, I, many of us thought that uh, by following this with our approaches, um, again, whether in the laboratory or the field, we would be able to push uh, the, the direction such that we'd get some real answers to this. And I think we did get answers. I mean, we've learned a tremendous amount about honeybee disease, for example, viruses that were previously unknown, uh, impacts of viruses and mites and bacteria and gut bacteria, good and bad, none of which we really knew that much about That's when this true. all started. So we've learned a lot. We've learned a tremendous a lot, a lot about field biology and field beekeeping uh, from the national surveys that are going on and from really hard sort of painstaking field experiments that were attempted to try to replicate CCD or to track beekeepers in the field and see over time how they uh, manage their bees and also what stresses those bees were facing in the field. So, so I think uh, it gets back to the good, I suppose, that uh, if you look at the, the collection of knowledge around beekeeping, it's gone up, you know, by half or maybe tenfold in the last 10 years. Tremendous amount of knowledge. Uh, and then the frustration, of course, is that we're still facing many colony losses, such as CCD. Um, and, and so that's the goal also for the future is to really expand, um, you know, maybe pull that knowledge back into a way that we can, we can make a difference to really understand these, these effects. One thing that uh, I've been traveling around the U.S. talking with lots of beekeepers and seeing different things, seeing different realities. And, and one of the people were commenting uh, a lot about the researcher com research community is not reaching out too much. I got a lot of people putting fingers in my face and saying those things to me. Nobody comes here. I mean, somebody come here, come a little kid and try to address the problem so fast that we just don't even trust anybody. I could agree, uh, Jay, to be honest. When I was there, I was there and talked with the beekeepers and see the realities and see the fears and see everything that was going on with them and they share their feelings, I could agree. What can we do to make this better? Uh, are the USDA trying to reach more? How can we do it? Because one of the reasons why I'm trying to do this channel is also to fill that gap, to try to reach more people and people have the opportunity to reach us mm -hmm. as researchers and we can know faster what's going on and see if we can help better or faster. Are USDA doing something like that? Can we, what we do, what can we do? Yeah. No, I, you've touched on a really important topic. I mean, we do, 
research studies, some of which take two years maybe, and they go into you know, this sort of collection of knowledge about bees and their stresses. And even when they're focused on the problems that are relevant to beekeepers, we have often failed in, in presenting that work and in translating it into something that they could use um, to manage their bees. Or, or also, maybe more importantly, we sometimes forget to, to listen to what's going on in the field or to get an opportunity, as you've done, to go work with beekeepers um, of all sizes, from the biggest operations yes, to the backyard beekeeper. And yeah, and sort of get sort of ground truth what's going on there as, as opposed to what we've picked up from these surveys and, and our own studies. So yeah, I think we're all a little bit guilty of, of um, these barriers. Some of it is, is simply a function of time to get out and do these studies. And some of it is, I think, again, different communities. You know, if you're so much focused and, and embedded in a research community, we might be less aware of what's going on on the ground, which is really why we're here as applied bee researchers, is we want to have a healthy bee community, both honeybees and other bees. And we want to um, do our part, if we can, to, to keep it that way. So, yeah, that's, that's uh, you know, I think I've learned as much about science as about, uh, and sociology in the last 10 years <laughs> from all of this, because I, I have realized that, that we have a duty as scientists, and, and we had neglected that in some ways to, to reach out a bit more. Um, that's not to say there haven't been great researchers uh, at the universities and at the USDA no, yeah. who have done that, and I think they've done tremendous jobs for decades and decades. So there are um, there are good examples of that uh, going on and that have been going on. But I think I think for all of us, we could we could um, stand to, to maybe drop some of those barriers a little bit. I don't think that I realize in those travel. Uh, in my trips with the beekeepers, Jay, was something that maybe is the other side too, with the beekeepers. The last example was this lithium chloride thing. I don't know if you, if you read the paper and you saw the paper and the whole social media just got crazy. And in four days, the stock of lithium chloride on Amazon was gone. So beekeeping seeing news and start to take actions in things that are not completely uh, authorized for that, they're not released, it's probably illegal. You know, these actions and this without proper orientation or study, that can really make a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I would like to hear from you also about that. How can we change it? How the beekeepers can feel confident maybe to reach out to us or, or stop to do this kind of thing to self-medication or, or at least, I don't know, what's your opinion about this self-medication or actions and it happens all the time. It does happen and I think it's, it maybe comes out of a desire, a need to keep these bees who people alive. are True. deeply attached to alive um, and this study which is again, happening in real time in front of us. Um, the actual uh, result, interesting result in this case, was carried out by a very, very careful researcher in Germany who- Which I respect too much. Tried, uh, was doing other projects and actually discovered this impact on Varroa mites, so this compound, um, but advertised even at the time and in his sort of early um, statements on this, um, as he tries to develop it, that, that there were some adverse effects on bees. And I think anytime you're trying a high concentration of a new compound or chemical, you can expect um, the potential for risk. And that's why we do have regulation on these and, and a process. So, so I think the, the risk for that and other new products uh, has to um, has to be checked both for the bees themselves, as as you've mentioned, maybe we've started to see adverse effects, and for the humans, right? We don't want anything yep. in the the hive is is should be a an environment that's that's free of these um, you know treatments inadvertent or planned or unplanned or from the environment or from the beekeeper. 
uh, because that's, yeah, there's, there's a great value, um, certainly in the health of the bees, but also the purity of the honey, the wax and such. And so, so this was a case, I think, where it maybe got a little too much um, uh, late work and excitement before we've really resolved what this is all about. And, and that is the frustration, I know, for beekeepers that new discoveries take so long to get onto the street, and this one might well make it legally onto the street. But as of now, it is, it is as they say, an illegal drug. It's not yeah. something that, um, that should be used uh, you know, at this point, and I think we need to um, be hopeful, but uh, be a little bit patient to see how this pans out. And again, it's, yeah, it, in human medicines or veterinary medicines, it does take a little while to yes. just really let things sort out and make sure they're, they are um, safe and, and effective in the, in the system they're designed for. And, and we do hope to, uh, in our laboratory and in others, USDA and, and university laboratories, we hope to help streamline that process because it should be fast, but it also needs to be effective and it needs to really resolve. Um, we don't want surprises down the road. No, yes. Jay, you told me about the good and the bad. There is any ugly? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I don't. I, I, it, it, it no longer keeps me up at night quite as much, but there's a. Yeah, I remember back in the day, so the, 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 the bad, as it were, was that with many um, heartfelt efforts and skills and talents, people all over the world addressing this. I think six months, a year in, we still weren't getting those um, clear-cut answers to what had happened to, to our bees and our beekeepers. Um, I think the ugly kicked in in year two as we continued these trials and continued to struggle and that's when um, you know the, the bouts of despair would hit and the uh, you would say that you know in the in our world the, there's you know people's hygiene fell apart and they were in despair and relationships suffered and oh. that was just the researchers you know so I also worry boy the beekeepers who are actually their life's savings their family's mm -hmm. support was mm -hmm. dependent on these bees and still is um, and so I really, at some point, when there weren't clear answers to this, um, I think it really did get a, get such that it was um, it was ugly, and it and it is hard. It's a great beekeeping is a beautiful profession. It's certainly I'm a hobby beekeeper. It's a beautiful hobby, and but if you do it year after year and you you just have to keep replacing your bees. Um, yeah, it's it's it wears on you after a while. So I think that was happening, especially um, in the case of CCD, when there wasn't an obvious cause to that, and nothing that you could really point a finger at and say, "Oh, I'll do this differently next time." Um, so almost, I also think that part of the ugly is the randomness, as it, as it seemed of it all. So some beekeepers would lose ninety percent of their hives, and others would lose none or ten percent. So it's almost like you were just gambling and nobody likes to gamble especially yeah. with farming and you know providing for your family so you're going there and and without much warning might lose a huge fraction of your whole business your whole industry and that that's got to be um that you know, we as researchers are buffered from that but that that's got to be incredibly hard to go through as a beekeeper as a scientist to another scientist mm -hmm. Did we mess up somewhere? Ooh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you can be a good scientist without acknowledging your mistakes yeah. and your... Because um, I want to hear what you have to say, because <laughs> I have some thoughts that I... Yeah. Oh. I think we maybe we could have been a bit more experimental at the start. I think many of us were analyzing samples and trying to build stories based on our results back in the laboratory or back even in the field, but just censusing colonies and I think while we had um, the opportunity more while it was fresh um, we might have uh, devoted more effort to kind of coordinating as a scientific group and with beekeepers to really test some of the going hypotheses uh, at the start you know in the field or, or there so I think we in some sense with with the phenomenon that that kind of snaps on and then snaps off you miss these opportunities to really do the, the relevant 
um, experiments to, to, to try to prove a cause. Um, I think that was one, one uh, way. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, none of us can really declare victory on, yep. <laughs> I think, you know, whether it's our own failings or just bad luck, I think, you know, just there is a certain frustration on all sides that, that this wasn't resolved uh, better at the time. Again, Jay, thank you very much for your time. Uh, that's a great opportunity to uh, people can ask questions for you, maybe. Can sure, I'll do my best. <laughs> and as you can see, I don't have all the answers, but okay. um, it's it's so. always as always fun to talk with you, Umberto. I enjoyed it when we were having lunches when you were uh, working in the lab, and I enjoy it today. So I also. Um, appreciate what you're doing and trying to address some hard questions with Be Health. And we need to keep the people together. When we start to fight, nothing happens over there. And please leave your questions. Jay Evans is going to try to address all of them. <laughs> Slowly but surely, yeah, we'll see. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you guys later and bye-bye. Thank you, Jay. Thank you.